on this day. Did you all enjoy an extra hour this morning? <laughs> Let's do this every Sunday. We'll just keep setting the clock back. No, maybe not. Um, friends, it is always good to be gathered with you and um, on this beautiful, oh, sunny, maybe warm day. Yeah. So just a few announcements as we get started. We are starting today a new series called A Wonderful Life, um, which is about money and meaning. Uh, today our theme is looking back, and um, I think this is going to be a, a great series. I'm really uh, excited about this. Um, it's making me do things that reflect and think on things and I, that we all would rather avoid, I think. So I hope you will uh, participate with me in, in doing some reflection and some, some inner work. Um, we sent out pledge cards to folks about a week and a half ago, and so we are inviting you and asking you to return a pledge card in, the, um, in this month of, of November, and thank you to everybody who already has done that. Another option is to uh, just go online to our, our, our website, firstpresmv.com. 
Com, and you'll find in the upper right-hand corner a, a giving button. And you can press on that, and you can set up online giving just easy peasy uh, that way too. So you can either do it with a traditional sending in the checks, or you can sign up online and, and take care of it that way. Either way, we are just really grateful for all of your support of our congregation and the work we do here. Um, this coming Thursday, which is, I think, the 7th, 11-7, yes. we're going to do, uh, we just, this is a, a, an impromptu thing, but the, um, we're going to partner with Seeds of Faith Lutheran Church over in Lisbon, and we're going to do a service together. November 9th, Saturday, is the 30th anniversary of the Berlin Wall coming down. And um, the ELCA came up with a service to acknowledge that uh, event. I don't know if you are aware of this or not, but a part of the reason that that wall came down is because Christians were gathering in churches um, leading up to that, just gathering in peaceful solidarity to support one another, and it grew and grew and grew. And it was that peaceful gathering and resistance there was a big part of bringing the Berlin Wall down. So we're going to acknowledge that in a service here at 7 o'clock. Um, we need to get that out on, on the Facebook page and on the website, but I hope you'll join us. It'll, we'll have some readings. Um, I'm going to share a story from my time uh, in the former East Germany five years after the wall came down, and um, I think it'll be a great time. And it will be cold. So we'll be warm and toasty here in the sanctuary, <laughs> gather, with, gather with nice, warm people. Next Sunday, anybody know what's happening next Sunday? The auction. the auction, that's right. And if you did not come in downstairs, I hope you will go down there for fellowship time and see the amazing items that are coming in. Um, oh, thank you. Linda Nost is our Vanna White. We have a few, just a few of the items that are, now I'm, now I'm doing Price is Right. Just a few of the items, up for bid on the, in the Price is Right. Um, and in fact, I'm gonna, I'm totally, uh, I feel a little weird about this, but I'm offering sourdough bread four months of, four times, and I baked this this morning. You can smell it. We'll be using that for communion. That feels, yeah, that feels kind of wrong, people, but, um, but Beth, Beth Reekers, Carl and Beth Reekers are gone this weekend, and I do like to bake bread, and I thought, oh, let's just do two birds with one stone there, but, yeah, lovely items. Thank you to everyone who has donated, and um, if you have friends that might be interested in some of the items, please do invite them. My mother is coming, so, um, yeah. We can do that. And then um, one final thing uh, that I have, but others might have announcements. Uh, traditionally in the Christian church, November 1st is All Saints Day. And we are going to, with the children, do a remembrance of our saints, people who have died in the last year. Um, from directly members of the congregation, um, Jay Gunn is the, is, is the only one. Um, and we've got his name on here, but I'm going to pass this around. And if you have other people in your life whose names you'd like to have read as part of that remembrance, uh, we will do that today. Okay? So I'll just read. I'm going to start with you. And we can just pass that around. So do we have other announcements? Have I forgotten something? Okay, we'd really like to have auction items by Wednesday so we can get the sheet and make sure everything on that is correct. Okay. All right. Then, I invite you to take a moment. So, this month, we'll be exploring money and meaning in a series called A Wonderful Life. And it uses, um, it draws on that classic film, It's a Wonderful Life, um, in which a money crisis <laughs> leads to a vastly different relationship um, 
with many different reactions from people in the community about what to do. And it really holds up a mirror for us um, in our own relationships with money. So I encourage you if, to watch the movie sometime this month if you um, have not done that lately. Get a little jump on Christmas. The relationship between our faith practices and money was as complex in Jesus' time as it is in ours. So this week we are going to look back at a moment when Jesus was uh, pushed on money. And we'll look at the origins of our own relationship to money as a first step of claiming a life that is rich in wonder, in love, in grace. Do I need to tell you that money is a topic that brings up uh, a lot of fear and anxiety for people? Maybe you are feeling anxious simply because I've said we're going to talk about money. So take a deep breath. <laughs> Breathe in and breathe out. And, and as part of that, we, are, uh, we, we have a special candle. Um, and we're noting the fact, we always have candlelight in worship, but we're noting this specifically because we are asking God to illuminate the shadowy corners of our lives where our unspoken and very powerful fears reside. begin by singing together our gathering song. light there is understanding where there is understanding there is compassion where there is compassion there is possibility where there is possibility there is transformation holy and living God transform our fears and into awe-inspired wonder open us to your light and to the rich possibilities that it brings us for a wonderful life.
God's grace gives us the courage to look back on our lives and see more clear clearly. Trusting in God's mercy, let us say how it is with us. Let us pray. God of creation, you give us a world capable of abundance, but we act as if it is a world of scarcity. You give us the resources and the intelligence to provide for all. Yet we lack the will and the vision to feed all of your children. Forgive us, God, for filling our plates while others go hungry. As you once again call us to your table, help us to respond in faith. Forgive our failures and help us to learn from them. Change our hearts and minds as we hear your good news proclaimed. Help us to taste and see the goodness that you have prepared for us and for the world. Amen. God's mercy is from everlasting to everlasting. We are accepted, forgiven, made new by God. Friends, believe the good news of the gospel. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Peace of our Lord Jesus Christ be with each of you. And, and also with you. Kids, come on. It's okay. We'll sing one more time, but you can come up while we sing the song during this month. To be full of love, to be full of grace, to be full of peace is a wonderful life. Hey friends, good morning. I have one little uh, piece of business to do. Okay, our clipboard hasn't gotten very far, has it? We had you doing all these things. The beginning, so uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to need that. Soon. <laughs> mm, all right. We'll, uh, but but while we're while we're doing that, while we're doing that, um, did you guys have a good Halloween? Was it? Did you stay warm enough on Halloween? That was a cold day. You know what? It was the snow was not very nice, was it? D Teddy came home and said, "Merry Halloween, Mom." That's what all the kids were saying at school. It was Merry Halloween. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. I thought it was April Fool's Day, personally. But it seemed like. Okay. Um, so in the church, the, the, so Halloween, you know, it was all Hallow's Eve. And they, they used, they believed, and I don't know, some people probably still do, that like the spirits of those um, who have died are close to, close to us, to come close that day. And uh, people used to dress up to, um, so people wouldn't recognize them and evil spirits wouldn't come and get them. Did you know that? So they would dress up so, th so they, weren't, they weren't recognizable. I mean, this is a long, 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 long time ago. And then the church said, you know what? We should, we should remember on the day after, on November 1st, all the saints who have lived and um, 
the Bible talks about the saints being like a great cloud of witnesses around us. Um, do you guys, maybe you're young enough that this has not happened so much with you, but have you had people that you have loved who have died? Have you? I sure have. Yeah, that's... And I brought pictures of a few of them. So this guy down here on the bottom, this handsome guy down there, that's my dad. My dad died about two and a half years ago. And I sure do miss him. Um, but I'm always thinking about uh, how I'm like him and all the, all the things that he gave me. Like, I'd, uh, I get weepy at um, heart, anything, like commercials or anything that tugs at your heartstrings. My dad always did that too. So we were a couple, we were a couple softies that way. Um, I also get from him my tendency to burn in the sunshine. And I'm probably less grateful for that, but what do you do? You can't choose it all, right? And then up above are my grandparents, my mother's parents, Floyd and Laureen Roby. And I am named for my grandmother, Laureen, which is really special. And um, from my, I mean, my grandfather was just always a funny guy. He just loved us so much and um, would tell us jokes and things and was just always fun to be around. And my grandmother was... Um, She's, she's part of the reason that, I, that, uh, I, that I'm a pastor, I think, um, because her faith was so strong. And she also loved to bake. And that is, a, that is a, a trait that she has passed on to all of her. She had three daughters, um, my mom being one, and that's been passed on, I think, to all of us. So just some of you know, the gifts that we get from people in our lives. Do you ever stop and think about that? The, the gifts that you get from people in your lives and your family. How, how, we do, how we doing? How we doing on that? Are we getting, it's coming. It's coming. Yeah, I know. It, it kind of just goes to, to tell us that, um, this is the way it is. Okay. How many of you are up here? One, two, three. Four. Oh, good. We're going to make it. Um, so let me tell you one other story. I remember the first time I went to a funeral. It was for my great-grandmother. And I remember sitting in the service, and I was probably around Vivian's age. And I was confused when we went from people crying in the funeral service, and then we went downstairs and people were laughing and eating. I was like, but this is a sad occasion. Mom, why are people laughing and eating now? They should be sad. And my mom said, well, we are both. When someone we love dies, we are both sad and we cry. But we are also joyful because they loved us and we have so many good memories. So we are both. I think that's a pretty good way to think about it. And I know, I've, well, my friend Barb says, you know, it's a good funeral when you laugh and you cry in, 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 in the same time span. So we, we try to do that, right? So... Um, we're going to try to focus on joy today because the sun is shining and we're grateful for people, wonderful people. So what we have here, and Vivian is all ready, are some bells. So everybody can take one bell and I want you to keep it quiet for now. <laughs> That's funny. I'm funny. Yeah. Okay, let's do a little, let's do a little practice. Ready? One, two, three. Yay, I chose a chord. I'm so glad. <laughs> uh, oh, it's, um, so the, they didn't, the sounds don't clash. Okay, so, okay, put the, so, so I need you to take the bell, put it down on the carpet. Okay, excellent, good job. Um, clipboard, it's all, but it hasn't gotten through the choir. Okay, so here's what we're gonna do. Larry, can you go get the clipboard? Um, we'll have Larry read the names. And then are you guys willing to say your names? Choir? Thank you. Okay, if you have, if you have, so Larry's gonna say a name and we're gonna ring a bell. And at the end, we're also gonna have a time where we ring the bells. Um, and we can remember, because we're really, we're just reading the names of people who have died in the last year, that's the tradition of the church, but just because somebody died two years ago or six years ago or 10 years ago or 20 years ago doesn't mean we don't think of them, right? So, so we'll have a time where you can just say the names to yourself while we ring the bells, okay? 
So when he says a name, we're going to ring the bell. Ring our bells. Got it? Okay. Gay gun. And then put it down on the... Then, yep, good. John Petrick. Herman Denkin. Wyatt Farrington. Dave Green. Marv Puspichel. Daryl Thumb. Tyler Hansen. Charlotte Ward. Faye Cranston. Leo Tucker. Chris Tucker. Lynn Schiffler. Anne Marie Deskin. Bob and Anna Dyburn. Dick Williams. David Poti. Alice Williams Stump. Alice Hansen. Wayne Wagner. Max Fitzpatrick. And any, any other names we want to remember? Okay. So now I invite you to just say the names of people that you want to remember who have died whenever, and we're just going to ring the bells. Ready? One, two, three, let's ring the bells. Just say your name. Lorene Roby, Floyd Roby, Herman Wonder, Elizabeth Wonder, Bill Wonder. All right. Thank you. Are your ears pierced? Now a little bit. Yeah. How about how about will you put them back in the basket for me? And then I have a prayer that I that I found that someone more clever than I am. Um, I know it's sad to let them go, isn't it? They're kind of fun. They're kind of fun. I'm glad you like my stool. I like it too. So someone much more clever than I did tied together, fall back. <laughs> with All Saints Day. So here's the prayer. Today we fall back, not just with our clocks that usher in the darker days of winter, but also we fall back upon our memories of loved ones gone from this realm. We fall back upon the emptiness that we still sometimes feel at their absence. We fall back upon our gratefulness that such a cloud of witnesses paved the way for us. We fall back upon our faith that just as the holy walked with them, so too the holy walks with us. And today let us also fall back into the arms of loved ones still with us and remember to tell them just how much they mean to us. Today let us fall back into the ever-present arms of the Holy One, remembering to say, thank you, thank you, thank you. So thank you guys for being here, and we thank God for each one of you and each one of you as well. And uh, let's, uh, oh, we're going to sing. We won't say the press prayer. We're going to sing as you head back to your seats, okay? And I think Sadie is downstairs if you are kindergarten or younger and want to go hang out with Sadie. <laughs>
For our worship series, we will be looking at a scripture reading, but also a scene from the movie, It's a Wonderful Life. And the movie starts with God making arrangement, arrangements to send an angel to assist George Bailey, played by Jimmy Stewart. God says, there's a man down on earth that needs our help. Clarence the angel responds, is he sick? God says, no, worse, he's discouraged. Like George Bailey, we sometimes need some help in the midst of the discouragement that can come with our fears about money. We look back with a practice of compassion for ourselves and others and a faith that reminds us of our true worth. So let us prepare our hearts and minds for the scripture this day by singing another verse from Be Thou My Vision. Be thou my vision and thou Our reading today comes from the Gospel of Matthew, the 22nd chapter. Then the Pharisees met together to find a way to trap Jesus in his words. They sent their disciples along with the supporters of Herod to him. Teacher, they said, we know that you are genuine and that you teach God's way as it really is. We know that you are not swayed by people's opinions because you don't show favoritism. So tell us what you think. Does the law allow people to pay taxes to Caesar or not? Knowing their evil motives, Jesus replied, Who do you test me, you hypocrites? Show me the coin you used to pay the taxes and they brought him a denarian. Whose image and inscription is this? He asked. Caesar's, they replied. Then he said, give to Caesar's what belongs to Caesar, and to God what belongs to God. When they heard this, they were astonished, and they departed. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I invite you to pray with me. May the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be acceptable in your sight. O oh God, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So when I first started thinking about doing this series, I was a little worried that it, it might feel um, like we were pushing things a bit to talk about It's a Wonderful Life in November. But I don't know about you, but this last week with the cold and the snow, I'm, I'm like ready for Christmas now. I'm, it feels very timely to be talking about It's a Wonderful Life. Um, that might change as I'm doing yard work this afternoon, raking all those leaves that were covered in snow. Um, so how many of you have seen It's a Wonderful Life? <laughs> uh, if, if you haven't, that's pretty good. That's pretty good. I hope, I hope you at least know like the, the storyline, and if you haven't seen it, try to see it. It's, it's great while we're in the series. Um, but uh, so the, the, the main, um, let me give you the main backstory that growing up, George Bailey, aka Jimmy Stewart, dreamed of traveling and seeing everything that the world had to offer. But his father died suddenly. 
just as he was ready to head off to college, and so George reluctantly takes over running the family, family's building and loan business. And, and the, 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 the conflict, the, the primary conflict in the film happens on Christmas Eve when Uncle Billy loses the $8,000 that he is taking to the bank to deposit. Um, viewers know that the villainous Mr. Potter has taken it hoping that this will put an end to his rival's business. A bank examiner is scheduled to arrive, and without that deposit, George Bailey knows that he will very well be arrested on criminal charges. So in despair, uh, George realizes that his insurance policy that has $15,000 on his life, he is worth more dead than alive. And the film shows George standing on a bridge that snowy night, planning to throw himself into the cold, dark, swirling waters below. It is a powerful image um, of George standing there alone on that bridge, just in the deepest, deepest kind of despair. George is married to the wonderful Donna Reed from Iowa. Um, he has children. He has extended family, he has co-workers, he has friends, he has neighbors, yet in the midst of this money crisis, he feels entirely and utterly alone. And that is how many of us feel when it comes to money, isn't it? Money, at least in terms of how, we, how much we have or, or don't have, is a very private matter in our culture. We can ask someone at a dinner party, you know, a cocktail party, well, so what do you do for a living? But you would never ask, so what was your net income last year after taxes? <laughs> Try that, I dare ya. <laughs> our money, how much we have now and will there be enough for the future touches some of our deepest fears and insecurities. We have anxiety around money. We may not want to talk about it, but the truth is, money touches pretty much every aspect of our life. Uh, writer and financial planner Maggie Kulik compares this to living inside a whale. Remember the stories about whales and sea creatures in mythology and literature with a, with a sea monster so enormous that it can devour people and ships and even entire kingdoms? You know, in some of those stories like Jonah or Pinocchio, people exist inside the belly of the colossal beast. Uh, sometimes those inside the whale are not even aware of their captivity. The whale surrounds them so completely that they do not realize where they are. So Kulik suggests that like the whale, our money system is so truly colossal, it encompasses every economic, social, industrial, and cultural structure in our complex society today. Every aspect of our lives is touched and influenced by our society's mammoth financial system. Like it or not, each of us is a part of the system. We live inside the whale. This was also true in Jesus' time. They were worried about how much money they had and whether they would have enough for the next year and the year after that and how they were going to pay the taxes and la 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 la. Perhaps that's why there are around 2,000 passages in scripture that address the topic of money or possessions. That's a lot. So take today's reading, for example. Just a bit of background. Um, we are set, it's, it's the 22nd chapter of Matthew. It is set during the Passover in Jerusalem, the last week of Jesus' life. It's midweek. We've already had Palm Sunday. Jesus has already cleared the temple. He has done teaching in the temple that has made enemies of all the religious power groups. Um, and so they've, they're in cahoots and they've come together. They've tried to come up with a perfect question to trap Jesus in front of the adoring Passover crowd. Here it is. Teacher, you're so wonderful. Answer this question. Is it lawful to pay taxes to the emperor or not? They think they've got him. If Jesus says, yes, it is lawful, he enrages those who are against the Roman Empire and their crippling taxes, which is 
most of the people there, the peasants, can hardly make it. They are absolutely crippled by these taxes. If Jesus says, no, it isn't lawful, he has said this in public and he is in danger with the Roman authorities. They think they have him, sure that he is about to lose face in front of everyone. Except that Jesus' answer sidesteps their intentions entirely and it catches them in their own hypocrisy. He asked to see a coin, right, that is used to pay the tax, a denarian. Now, whoever had this Roman coin should not have. A graven image was expressly forbidden by Jewish law, and they were in the temple. So it could be that just by asking for the coin, Jesus embarrassed these challengers, showing them to be the hypocrites. They were. But then he asks whose image is on the coin, and everybody knew whose image was on the coin. It was an image of the emperor, Tiberius, and the inscription. What's the inscription? Tiberius Caesar, august son of the divine Augustus and high priest. High priest, they're in the temple. This is blasphemy. And finally, Jesus offers his brilliant rebuttal. Give to Caesar what belongs to Caesar and to God what belongs to God. The Roman coins bear the image of the emperor. What is it that bears God's image? <clears throat> we do. Every good Jew knew from Genesis chapter 1 that God created humankind in his image. In the image of God, he created them. That was bedrock for them. They would have also known the opening verse from Psalm 24. The earth is the Lord's and all that is in it, the world and those who live in it. So, what is it that bears God's image? Human beings. And what belongs to God? Everything. Yes, the coins then and now belong to the emperor, right? To the empire, to the powers that are. And they do their best to stamp their image. The, the money people do their best to stamp that image into us and onto us and own us, right? But the ultimate reality for us is, our ultimate reality is that we are made in God's image and everything, everything belongs to God. Even, even while we live inside the whale, it's a paradox. It's a paradox. But it's true. You may have heard the phrase that Christians are, to be, are called to be in the world, but not of the world. So we are in the whale. It's just a fact of life. But we don't have to be of the whale. Because we are made in God's image, and we belong to Jesus Christ. We follow in the way of Christ, not the way of the world, or the financial whale and what they tell us we're supposed to buy and do and be with our money, there are even ways that we can influence the whale. How? You know, how? How do we do that? How do we not just fall into this into step with the drumbeat of capitalism, of hyperconsumption, the pursuit of success and the accumulation of wealth and all the definitions of what means you have succeeded as an American, right? We do that by keeping the mind of Christ through intentional practices, by small moves and habits that help shape our lives and who we are. Maggie Kulik wrote in her book, Integrating Money and Meaning, the point of spiritual practice is to train the heart toward love, both giving and receiving, and for the wielding of love's power. I love that. Spiritual practices are to train the heart toward love, both giving and receiving, and for the wielding of love's power. I want some of that. How about you? Um, we'll be offering an idea of some practices um, each week of our series. And our first practice is, is just to take the time, take some time and reflect, to think. Do some of the inner sifting and searching. Where did 
your ideas about money come from? Where do they come from? So when we look back, think about, think about um, did you have parents who were always worried that there wasn't enough? Or maybe you had parents or grandparents who showed love through things, gifts, or cash. Perhaps your parents gave generously to all sorts of causes, or maybe you heard them arguing about money or the family business all the time, or someplace in between, right? Maybe you grew up with financial support from your family so that you always knew you had a, had a fallback, right? You had, had a safety net. Or maybe you knew that from the beginning you were on your own and you've had to scrape and struggle and make it on your own all the way. Each of us has a money story, and these stories shape us. So I invite you to take the time this week to remember and acknowledge this. I've got a handout here with some of the questions that uh, I'll, I'll put in the front pew, maybe pass out. And it may make you anxious and uncomfortable, and that is okay. That is okay. We should not avoid the things that make us anxious and uncomfortable. That often means that it's something we need to pay attention to, and spend some time with. We can do hard things. And as we do this, remember this. This is perhaps the most important thing. No matter what our financial bottom line is, our worth is not derived from our money. Our worth as human beings has no relationship to finances. Our worth comes from God, who made us in God's image and claimed us in our baptism as Christ's own forever. Give to God what belongs to God, Jesus said, reminding us that we are God's own. In life, in death, in life beyond death, we belong to God. And thanks be to God for this. Amen. to God. In gratitude, let us pray as we prepare to present our offerings. Gracious God, looking back 
we see the generosity of those who came before us, acknowledging their hardships and struggles, their joys and gains that bring us to the place we are now. In looking back, help us to build a foundation for those who will look back at our lives, those who will attend by what we do, what we offer, what we give. Help us to rejoice in the knowledge that their lives are being changed now and in the future because of what we are able to do with this collective offering. In the name of one who calls us, Jesus the Christ, Amen. Just a few words of instruction as we prepare to celebrate together the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. A reminder that this table does not belong to First Presbyterian Church of Mount Vernon so much as it belongs to our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. All those who love him and want to know him more are welcome at this table. It's our practice to serve by intinction, which means we have prayers of servers at the, at the base of the steps. You're invited to come down by the center aisle um, from front to back. Choir will, will go around first and then fall in line behind them. You'll be handed a piece of bread, and then you may dip that bread into one of two chalices. The whitish has wine. The grayish has grape juice. Either one will impart the grace of Christ to you. And then we invite you to return to your seats by the side aisles. Today we are also going to sing a hymn, which is hopefully simple. Come to the table of grace, number 507. And we'll just sing as we are served and receive and, and pray together. Friends, this is the joyful feast of the people of God. People will come from north and south and east and west to sit at table in the kingdom of God. According to Luke, when our risen Lord was at table with his disciples, he took bread and blessed and broke it and gave it to them. Then their eyes were opened, 
and they recognized him. Our Savior invites all those who are hungry to share the feast that he has prepared. The Lord be with you. And also with you. Lift up your hearts. We lift them up to the Lord. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. At the beginning of everything, you took what was nothing and made it something. You multiplied goodness, breathing life into the void. You created us for love and then kept drawing us back in when we knew not what to do with such abundance. When life seemed to turn against us, you lifted us up and gave us hope. You promised to remain with us and spoke encouragement through the ages. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed is your son, Jesus Christ. He offered the Spirit's economy that de de defied human systems, preaching good news to the poor, proclaiming release to the captives, recovering of sight to the blind, setting at liberty those who are oppressed, and announcing that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and ate with sinners for no other reason than because God's grace is abundant, profligate and knows no bounds. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. Taking the bread and lifting the cup, he opened to us a path of salvation and a meal full of grace. And so, in remembrance of your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer our lives and our love as a holy and living sacrifice, in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is tied. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Come, Holy Spirit, and pour out the riches of your blessing upon us and upon our meal this day. Make us one, multiplying our love by the strength of yours until all have everything they need in the feast of your kingdom on earth as it is in heaven. Amen. And friends, let us pray the prayer that Jesus taught. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Our Lord Jesus, on the night before he met death, took bread. And after giving thanks to God, he broke it. And this is going to be challenging. And he gave it to his disciples and he said, take and eat. This is my body broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. <coughs> and the same way after supper, he took the cup. <coughs> and he said, this is the new covenant sealed in my blood shed for you for the forgiveness of sin. Whenever you drink it, do this in remembrance of me. Every time you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the saving grace of our risen Lord until he comes. Friends, these are the gifts of God for the people of God.
verse again. Friends, let us pray. Holy God, we thank you for this feast of grace and life. As we have been served, help us to serve our neighbors. As we have been fed, help us to feed all who are hungry. As we have been loved, help us to love the world. Because in Christ Jesus, you have loved us. Amen. Wonderful Life, you may remember that there is a scene in Bailey Park, the, um, the affordable housing that George Bailey and the Bailey Brothers Building and Loan builds for people, and there's a scene where George and Mary, his wife, are at a house blessing for the Martinis, and they bring gifts for them, and we have them on our table. Uh, they bring um, bread that this house may never know hunger. Salt, that life may always have flavor. And wine, that joy and prosperity may reign forever. All of these symbols are, uh, are from our faith journey as well, right? The bread of life that is the true sustenance for us that God provides. Uh, the fruit of the vine is the love that is poured out upon us by Jesus, a sign of the never-ending grace that is ours now and forever. And Christ has called us to be salt for the earth, right? Salt for others, so that we might all savor the flavor that um, the Holy Spirit brings to our lives. You have been reminded of these things, I hope, in our time together. Now go into the world in peace to love and serve the Lord, for it is a wonderful life. And as you do so, remember that the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the power of the Holy Spirit are at work in you and the people 
around you and the world out there ahead of us this day and forevermore. Amen. Mm-hmm.